Welcome back, everybody. This is Film Session Saturday, and I'm sitting with some great tech people here. Um, my name is Aaron Price. I am uh, executive producer of SPNN's Candy Fresh and Crown Sound, as well as host of WFNU 94.1 FM's show, Crown Sound Radio. And I'm sitting here with Joanna Kohler, is it? Uh, who is a filmmaker, a media educator, and advocate for youth in media, and founder of Kohler Productions, and host of Cinnamon, is it? Interesting, interesting, I'll check that out. A show highlighting local and national filmmakers in the Twin Cities. And at the end, we have Terry Gray, who is a multi Emmy Award winning audio operator and mixer for TPT, as well as independent music producer and songwriter. He's worked on over 100 regional and national PBS series and is also freelance for ESPN. So uh, give a round of applause for these great panel that we have here. Thank you, thank you for coming out. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask a few questions and, uh, and, and try to peek into you guys' lives a little bit. Okay, so I think the, um, the first question we can ask is, uh, what made you choose this path that you guys went down on? I'll take it. Uh, I just was, I've, I've always done this. I've never not done it. I was fortunate enough to be raised in this neighborhood, uh, St. Paul Central graduate and in the late 80s our mid to late 80s, and we had a wonderful fine arts program. Uh, so you could do dance, you could do theater, you could do recording, you could do television. And in my four years at Central, I went between recording studio and television. And at one point, I said, okay, which one do I like more? And I love television. So in the, in the 80s, I was producing with, a, with my best friend in high school. We started just making our own TV shows, and we had this thing called the Friday Video Show. So it was once every couple Fridays, sometimes every, you know, once a month, sometimes twice a month. We would shoot a 20-minute show, and they were, we would do where some of the other production groups were doing, hey, we were in the talent show, we want to show our performance of the talent show. Mark and I used to just make our own stuff, and we were big cinema fans. So we would watch The Terminator. We'd watch Star Wars. We were influenced by all that stuff, and we would try to do our own versions of those. So we wound up doing a 20-minute show, and I knew right then and there at 16 that I was going to be doing this for a living. And I've managed, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to do it for almost 30 years. Um, I, I would say that I got into this, I always, as a young person, was interested in like messages, and I was doing a lot of art and uh, things like that nature, but it wasn't until I met Chris Sorensen, who is a woman who runs what's now called In Progress in St. Paul, and she came into a queer youth organization that I was hanging out in and did a video class. Mm -hmm. And I had been exposed to video in a couple other ways um, through my like, school and stuff like that, but it had never resonated with me until she came and did that class. And when I saw the potential for uh, voice, and uh, you know, she really embraced uh, kind of a lyrical forms of of voice that it that that's what I fell in love with. And then, I, and like, I made my first film when I was 18. Uh, it was a critical film of the like social services in the Twin Cities. Um, got a lot of backlash. People were a little upset with me for that film. <laughs> but uh, seeing that potential. Uh, was amazing, and it's, it, it, it took me, as a young person, from feeling voiceless to feeling like I had a voice, and, and I think that that kind of experience actually, uh, not to get too deep, like right off the bat, but like, you know, saved my psyche. Mm. I mean, I think young people that are oftentimes, uh, go through, you know, the, the becoming an adult and, they, and the experiences that they have, that they can become, you know, fractured. They can become they they get can become damaged if they're in a situation where they don't feel like they have a voice. Uh, and to find a tool like filmmaking uh, to realize that kind of potential uh, is is about safety, and then can be about like love and and dreams and feeling like you can be anything. And uh, I would say that's what drew me to filmmaking. Nice, nice, nice. So I know um, you know you guys. Uh, got involved into this type of work in your when you were teenagers. 
Um, and I know, Terry, you brought up uh, watching movies like Terminator and um, uh, Star Wars and whatnot, but was there any, 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 anybody who was like a personal influence that you may have, uh, you may have talked to or maybe a, a, an adult or somebody like that that made you want to get involved in this type of work um, when you were uh, Most a teenager definitely. as well? Most definitely. Uh, my television teacher at uh, Central, Ron Rogoszewski, is one of the main reasons why I'm still here doing this. Um, we also had in our audio department, Ben James, who is the audio teacher. So it's basically my teachers in high school. They were the ones that, you know, that really were the men early mentors. Uh, so yeah, Ron and Ben and Red Freeberg, who used to own a recording studio here in town over in, um, off of Snelling Avenue, he's the one that gave me my, or sold me my first reel of 24 track tape. And it's like, I remember that stuff was expensive, and it's like, wow, I have 24-track tape. Now I have to actually go record on it. But those are the people that saw it early enough and were always encouraging us to keep moving and to keep doing it. And so uh, some of the other panelists have said earlier today, I was always doing something, whether it was musically re musical or recording-related, sound-related, video-related, we were, and we had limited stuff, we had limited technology. I mean, these are the early video cameras when they were really big and you had the separate deck and it wasn't like the iPhones and things that we have now. We just, you know, so, but we were always pushing our, those early mentors were like, you can do anything. They told us, you could do anything. Just go do something, go take this stuff, take advantage of the fact that you have this stuff and you have access to it, go make something. And we would just go do it. We didn't even, we were too dumb to know that we, it was, the stuff we were using was really limiting. Mm -hmm. So we just did it. And you, Joanna, was there any person that was an influence when you were getting your start in video work? Yeah, I think, you know, like it took, there's, you know, several mentors that were non video or non film related, right? That, that kind of set me on a path or okay. showed me a vision of what was possible as a human being. And then it was people like Chris Sorensen um, and uh, Benny at the time, Matthias, uh, you know, in intermediate arts, ironically, <laughs> um, was like those spaces were, were spaces where all of a sudden uh, you had this blend of sort of this, you know, uh, people that, that embodied the kind of person you wanted to be in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might say, you know, like trying to be woke or something like that. <laughs> um, and then they had the tools. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, you get your hands on the tools. It was like, you know, going over to Chris's, at the time she was doing a lot of this out of her apartment, you know, mm -hmm. going over there and it'd be like, you know, the, like she had a nonlinear system all set up. Like when she, we, I first took the class with her and I, was, you know, made a project with tape and, well, everything was tape, but nonlinear <laughs> tape <laughs> to edit it. And like that was annoying. And then all of a sudden, you know, like my first film, it was like right at the cusp of like, I don't even know if it was Adobe at the time that came out. That was like a premiere, D, like the D, whatever. It was Adobe, not. I think it was first. Yeah, yeah. premiere DV yep. or something like that, right? And it's so like, and then it was digital, mm. even it was tape, but it was like you could do it in a nonlinear way. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I fell in love with it. And it was like having the, any time, like having the tools there, like just the, uh, the willingness to be like, yeah, here, take the camera, go. Mm. The, and, and you know, like she handed cameras out to young people that, you know, like you don't know what's gonna happen to that camera. I'm sure, you know, like SPN's youth program does that here too. I shouldn't probably say it like all loosey-goosey, like they hand out equipment. They just give you um, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like the people that like, cause that's expensive stuff. And you know, you, you always took care of it, but it was like amazing to me that they just let it go out the door. And then it was like, but you got to capture things that were in your life. And then, and then you'd come back and then, you know, she took us out to New York, uh, Chicago to go meet with other filmmakers and stuff like that. And just to realize that there's a connection between you putting your hands on this camera over here and, and going home and, and looking at it and being like, that's in my house. Right. To like, oh my gosh, it's like New York, Chicago, like it's possible. Right, right, right. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because when I started getting involved into uh, video work, it started in high school. So it's, it's, it's interesting that it's just like in high school, that's that time, you know. Um, I wasn't really even that interested in video work. I was doing a lot of music production, and I had a teacher who came up to me and said, you know what, Aaron, I think you would really like to do video work. 
and she showed me and I was hooked ever since. So I can definitely understand, you know, um, how a, a teacher can just come to you or somebody and just say, hey, you know what, you should check this out. And the next thing you know, you just fall in love. Like, I, I, I don't even, I'm not gonna say I don't do music anymore, but video work is like that, that video. deal, right? Videos, I was about to say <laughs> videos, that deal, it's hard, because I had to make that choice between music. Uh, for me, music, choosing, doing music is hard. Right. It's it's a hard. I mean, it's easier to make money, and it's easier to be. You can. It's easier to have more success doing video if you're good at it than music. Music right. is such a crapshoot. But what I've learned is, you take music and incorporate that into video. Some of the first things I did in my first job. I used to work here at SPNN, oh, but nice. it was cable access, and we were downtown. Um, but I used to do music for video. Right, right. right. So again, taking the things that you love and rolling it all in. And so it's like, yeah, I may not ever have a number one hit or something on MTV, but I music, I got music placed in commercials. Right. You wow. know, so you just figure out how to do it. But having the access or at an early age was tremendous. I mean, how many, not, there aren't many people that can say at 14, 15, 16 years old that this is what I want to do. You're so grabbed by it. You're so hooked by it. Right. Man, I can't imagine. I left television for six months, and I sat in a cubicle. It was a tech. It was a tech job, doing high speed data, and I was there for six months. And I'm like, now I got to go back to TV. And I've never. I've been there ever since, and I've never left, and I'll never leave it again. I'll nice. retire doing television. Nice, nice, nice. So um, on that note, uh, uh, my next question uh, I would like to ask is if, if there was any trials or um, or failures that you that you think they had to have a positive or negative uh, impact on your drive for success. So was there any any factors um, during your your time doing this work that whether it was um, uh, uh, something that may have knocked you down, but you, you didn't let it stop you. You just said, you know what, this is a learning experience. Because a lot of us, we, we get involved in this type of work and um, something can happen where it just says, you know what, I don't know if I can do this anymore. But what made you say, you know what, this is a learning experience. I'm just going to keep on going for it. Was there something that happened in your life that knocked you back at just a minute and said, you know what, this is a learning experience. I'm going to keep going. It still happens to me daily. I'm a, I'm a professional sound person, audio director. And things that I do, you, you develop your tricks and your, your, the things that you do, the things that you know work. Every day for me is different. I come into a different situation, whether it's mixing a live broadcast or whether it's miking somebody on location and we hide mics. And what worked for me on Tuesday will not necessarily work for me on Thursday. And I think, well, just when you think you've got your game right and I've got all my little tricks, you run into the person that comes in wearing the wrong thing. And you're like, well, I don't know. Okay, that, now I've got all kinds of scratchiness. And you get good. It's funny because when you're in the business and when you're doing a freelance or you're doing it for a company like I, do, like I work for, you're only as good as the last thing you did. And if you get known as, oh, you're, you're pretty good at that. You're pretty good at delivering sound. And then you have that off day. Mm. So I haven't had a, an ex one thing that has really brought me down. I've had a series of things mm. that have brought me down. But then even in the successes, there's still things that I did wrong. I, I wound up mixing the Ryder Cup last year when it was here in the Twin Cities. And it's the biggest thing I've ever done. I was mixing. It didn't, it didn't dawn on me until I was deep into it that into deep into setup, like, well, I'm going to mix for the world. This is a worldwide broadcast. A whole bunch of people are going to be listening to me, listening to what happens here. And I'm mixing Sounds of Blackness. I'm mixing Aloe Black. And these people are coming in and out, and they're listening to the rehearsals and blah, blah, blah. And you're as prepped as you can be. We hit air, and I played the wrong thing. The opening of the show, for like 10 seconds, you heard a music cue. You heard Sounds of Blackness music cue because I hit the wrong button. Wow. You could beat yourself up and tank the rest of the show, or you can just keep going. It ended up being a good show, and if you were an audience at home, you didn't really, it just sounded like, hey, they opened with a little bit of music, it faded out, director's screaming. <laughs> <laughs> My director's going, what are you doing? That's not, that's their cue. And then you just bring up the, you bring up the VOG, and you start the show, and so there are those kinds of things that happen to me on a daily basis. Mm. Not daily, I don't want to sound like I'm a bad sound person, but <laughs> they happen. You just right. have to be ready and you have to be able to react to what's going on. And then once you do that, you just learn from it. I've learned, okay, 
don't ever do that again. But right. even on a world stage, I still made a mistake. The rest of the show was flawless. Mm. But it just it's TV. We're not, we're not saving lives. We're not doing brain surgery. It's just TV at the end of the day. All right. How about you, Joanna? Was there anything that you could recall during your time um, coming up? Was there any, or was it similar to like uh, Terry, where there's a series of things that can happen, but you just keep pulling through? Um, no, nothing. <laughs> nothing's ever gone wrong. Right. Uh, no, I would say that, like, I think, you know, a little bit different is I don't work in a company, you know, like, and, and I'm not, I mean, like, I, I, I can freelance, but that's not really my thing. Like, so, um, you know, so I, I would say that the thing that's the hardest for me is that, you know, I'm, I'm running a company. Right. So I'm having to, you know, f you know, find the clients, find the projects, produce it and, and get it, you know, and so like, it's a lot of um, having to motivate yourself constantly, mm -hmm. you know, and, and from my standpoint, you know, like I oftentimes look at people who are working in a company and I'm just like, God, that just looks so luxurious. You know, you just, you like, you come in, you're like, you know, you roll, you're going to do that thing. And then, you know, but it's so like, you have to constantly be up. And, um, you know, I think that's been a challenge. I think uh, on a like deeper and a more like, you know, in a personal level, like when I first got into this, I uh, got into it in such, a, in such a way that it wasn't connected to the larger film community. And so I ended up making, you know, three films where I wasn't really connected to the larger film community. And learning, and, and that was just like, for me, that was a self-esteem issue. Like not knowing how to go socialize, uh, with people that I was really intimidated by or feeling like I didn't belong there or like it just wasn't my group. Like I, you know, like you see, you know, you get stereotypes about like who's in the film industry and you're like, oh, that's not me, you know, like I'm not gonna do that. And I would say that that was in the beginning that that was probably more of my obstacle is figuring out how do I bring myself to this? How do I reach out and, and stop trying to uh, imitate or, or, or be something that I think is, is what I'm supposed to be to be in the eyes of other people successful. Like stop trying to look successful to other people, you know, like just and just and just enjoy doing it and, and letting it be what it's going to be. Still have the drive and still go out there and do that and, and pursue things and you gotta keep working at it. Um, but you know, trying to and that's a life thing, right? Like trying to drop the the ego of it. You yeah. know, you gotta have some to to sell your stuff. Um, but to not internalize it so much that like when there's a failure, like if you bring up the wrong music, that it's not you, right. you know, <laughs> it's, yep. it's not you. It's like in that moment, somebody in that room might say it's you. <laughs> oh, you're going to get yelled at big time in that moment. <laughs> but again, it's not you. And again, we're not doing that. That's the thing. The thing I've learned, we're, it's hard because you want to say we're not saving lives. Now, there are a lot of people in this industry that do things that feel like, wow, there's a lot of self-importance. Like, what I do is so important. But at the end of the day, it's film, it's TV. We impact people, or your project may impact someone, but in the moment, you're not, we're not doing brain surgery. I'm not doing open heart surgery. I'm not launching a space shuttle or a rocket to the moon or anything like that. I'm just doing television or film, and you can't make it any more than it is. And again, if you can learn from it, great, I now know what button not to hit. <laughs> right, right. Well, if I can just add on that, like, I think as a, like, documentary background, we think, you know, you come into it, because in, like, even, like, the start of, like, you know, you, you get a voice or whatever, you think you're, you're saving the world. And then you also have to realize at the end of the day, no matter what the story is that you're telling, people, people going to make their way right. through life regardless of, you know, like, you, you, you want to make the best story you can. Like, and you want to engage it as if it is, you know, life-saving. Like, you want to bring that kind of energy to right. it and that commitment. But at the end of the day, also realizing that, like, you know, your film isn't the thing that's, like, going to change, you know, big issues. No, it isn't. I think what it is is, I think when we create things, when we do documentary work for my company, uh, for TPT, if we can get you to, if we can be, help be a change agent, if we can get you to go watch something, go, wow, you know what? Because we do a lot of medical stuff. You know, we talk to a lot of people that are going through things. And it's like, if I can watch that and go, ooh, that might motivate me at home as the viewer to make a change, great. But we're not changing the world. We're just telling you a story. We're telling a story. It's storytelling. That's what we do here. We, w we wouldn't even have a story if it wasn't for the people that were doing the work. Right. So it's like, you know, like if they're doing great work, they're changing the world. Right, right, right. Um, 
I guess my next question, um, talk a little bit about, you know, we, we always talk about those big breaks, you know, that, that one thing that happens that changes the course of your life and your, and your career. Can you recall that moment that you were working on something and that changed the course of your career? As far as, um, you know, we all start out at a certain level, we're working our way up, and then you get that opportunity, and then it's like, boom. Yeah, for me, um, I've always worked for companies, and I always had the safety. I worked, uh, worked for Channel 5 up the street, and then when I got tired of news, I left to teach, and I taught for a while, uh, broadcast, or I taught film and video and music at high school for recording arts. And then the economy tanked in 2009, and everybody, a lot of people, a lot of us lost our jobs. So I licked my wounds and decided what I was going to do next. I was always working at Channel 2 part-time. I had a tech job there. I was working in the air control department. And then I started freelancing. And I didn't know what to do, but I bought a DSLR, and I just started doing things. But what I, the tool for me that worked early on for me, the thing that caused my big break is I put everything on Facebook. Mm. And this is, you know, back in 2009. So, and what I would put on Facebook was me working. I was constantly doing a commercial. If I was in a satellite truck or if I was in a production truck working on something with a new piece of gear, I was constantly taking a picture of the gear going, this is what I'm doing today. And what happened was, was people started to see that. And then another friend of mine was, a freelance friend of mine was working on a group and they were doing exercise videos and they bought all this gear and they go, we don't know how to run any of this stuff. And a friend, and my friend said, hey, I saw a picture of Terry on Facebook running that piece of gear. So that's what helped me get the break using Facebook. So then I started doing exercise videos and then I found myself going out to California doing something with Jillian Michaels. Wow. So, you know, those, nice. those are those I, you know, people ask me, how did you get there? Me posting my work. Just going, hey, I'm working with the, and from a technical perspective, not a bragging or geek, you know, it was more of a geek perspective. Mm -hmm. Look what I did. I chained three of these key pro decks together, 12 of these key pro decks together. Somebody remembered that, mm -hmm. and they saw that I knew that I had that skill. Mm -hmm. and, but, and with me, I'm finding that it's constant through my career. I mean, I've been at Channel 2 for 10 years, but I just moved into the audio director position because somebody there decided to give me a break. Mm -hmm. So it's been an evolution in a series of breaks that, you know, again, a friend called and said, do you want to mix Ryder Cup? So my career has gone up, and there's just, it's been a series of just those events. Mm. So I can't say it's any one thing, it's just been a series. Well, if I can piggyback, it's, it's not quite dodging the question, but <laughs> the plane, like the plane with equipment is critical because the equipment is changing constantly. And so like, you know, just going in like every, every project when I'm going out and doing something, I try to figure out, okay, what can I do that's a little bit different than what I've done before? You know, cause like, I don't want to make the same stuff every time I go out and, and do something. And I end up putting in more work into those projects than you're supposed to, right? right. But it's like at the end of the day, it's like, no, I figured out how, you, you know, like if you're chaining up equipment, you know, I figured out what can happen if I'm, I'm doing this thing. And you might not want, like in some cases, I may not want to take a picture of that so everybody can see what I did to achieve the effect. <laughs> but, you know, but it's, it's just playing. It's, it's continuing to play. And, um, you know, and I think you've got to have that kind of passion for the, the tools. You got to like light up at them because you're not going to get paid for every hour that you're, you're doing it. Um, you know, and it, and you know, the economy changing, this industry is completely changing. You know, everybody I know in this industry is trying to figure out like how to have a steady Paycheck, you know, like the how people, in the, especially in the freelance world, have been employed, uh, is has changed, is changing, um, and will continue to change. There's always a, a conflict between, you know, the young people that are acclimated to the kind of equipment that is now, and then are entering the marketplace, and then, you know, you got people that were brought up a certain way with certain kinds of equipment, and they, you know, like and and have like also ridiculous skills that are amazing, um, and they're all in the same marketplace, you know? So like, you always have to be uh, playing. You just, you know, with, no matter what it is, it, you know, you, you can't come, you know, like one, maybe one day you come to a project, and I, you're not supposed to say this out loud, but like, you know, you're just getting through the project. But trying to come every day with like the enthusiasm of like, what can I possibly do 
here to to just see what's possible mm. you know and you're gonna and like just what what can i possibly include in here from an audio perspective or right. what can i possibly include in here from a lighting perspective that's not required that more than likely my, my client is not even going to realize what i did you know and they and and oftentimes they don't realize what they got that, that, that actually like probably cost more than I charged because I was trying something. Um, but then you're like, oh, I, it, you just keep playing. And you, you just, you're, you, then when you're on your next project, you know exactly how you can do something. You never stop learning. That's how I, I, I like to teach. I teach a, uh, a semester at IPR every now and then just because I like to teach. I like to give back what I've learned. And, but you never stop learning. Like you said, it's the, the, the gear is going to constantly change and it's going to, and I'm a geek. I'm a gear geek. So, I love the newest, latest, greatest thing, and sometimes I will use the latest, greatest thing on a project when I'm not supposed to, just because I want to figure out how it works, and I'm always looking for, as another friend of mine, I'm going to steal his phrase, I'm always looking for the elegant solution. Mm. I'm always looking for a new way to do something and to do it cleaner and better and faster. Uh, we have um, the tools we have now, especially if I'll speak from the audio standpoint, the tools we have now are absolutely amazing. I don't even like discussing them because I like People to think and clients and producers to think what I do is voodoo. You know, uh, there are tools out there that you can shoot in the most, the, the, in terms of noise. It can be, you could hear the vent, you could hear cars passing by, and I can remove all of that stuff. And I just want the client to go, wow, you did an amazing job. But there's tools out there and just, they're expensive tools and you have to know how to use them. Right. So that's kind of how I look at it. It's it you, but I'm constantly looking for the next tool that will allow me to do my job faster. Because if it's if I'm freelancing, if I don't, if I can cut my hours down from ten hours to five, because I can learn, I've learned this new tool or this new trick. That's more time I get to spend with my family, you know. Nice. And you know, throughout this conversation, you guys talk a lot about um, you know uh, tools and, and the things that you guys use and and um, different types of tools and equipment. Is there any particular brands? that you guys, um, you don't necessarily got to tell everybody every single one, but some brands that you keep finding yourself coming back to because it gives you that type of quality that you always look for when you're doing your craft. I could do a dissertation on that. Um, it's funny because audio folks are, tend to be, we tend to be gear snobs. And you, when you want to work in this business, there are maybe two or three brands that you that they say you have to have, and if a production manager is calling from California to book you to do a shoot here or to go somewhere to do a shoot, and they ask what your gear list is, if you don't mention those two or three brands, you won't get the gig, which is a shame. Mm. It's a shame uh, because I think it's you're hiring me because I'm really good at what I do. I can take a I can take a cheaper product and still do what I need to do with it. But the biggest one would be for audio folks is sound devices. They make the Cadillac high-end you know, recorder that's $5,000. And when the PM production manager calls you to hire you for a freelance gig, they're gonna go, what are you using? If you don't say sound devices, you might not get the gig. Mm. So you have to buy that stuff. But what's happening, the technology is changing so much. You get a company like Zoom, and I'm not trying to do product endorsements or anything, but you get a company that says, we're gonna do what the big boys do, but we're gonna knock the price way down and we're gonna make it so that everybody can use this stuff. That's happened in the last two years and the last couple products that Zoom has made has forced sound devices to make cheaper stuff. Mm. So where the sound devices stuff was five, $6,000 for an audio recorder, field recorder, they brought one out that's $1,200. Mm. So you, I love that innovation. I love the fact that there are companies thinking about filmmakers because that's a huge, it's not a big market, it's a niche market, so let's be honest. There aren't a lot of people making films or making music. Right, right. But there are companies out there that realize they could tap into that, kind of like Canon did with the 5D when that came out and that became the thing. If you, there's enough of us doing it that if we make something at the right price point, we'll sell a ton of them. So those for me, it's like sound devices for software, it's Pro Tools, um, that's what I mix in, that's what I mix TV shows in. I would like to not use Pro Tools, but it is, it's the industry standard. If you watch a film, it was mixed in Pro Tools. If you listen to the radio, that hit record, it was mixed in Pro Tools. So you have to have those tools in order sometimes to get the gig. Not sometimes, maybe almost all the time. You know, So that's kind of how I feel about, those, about tools. 
How about you, Joanna? Is there any particular brand you find yourself coming back to? You know, I'm in a little bit of a different position because because I'm not in like sort of the the uh, ad agency world. I'm not in the Hollywood, you know, LA world. I'm not. Right. So I'm in a little bit of a different situation. That what I'm looking for. I mean, like I, f f as far as like my camera gear, I tend to stay with the same brand. Um, because as I change cameras and stuff like that, all everything translates. And so I liked, you know, it's cheaper for me to be able to translate everything, you know what I right, mean? Right. And I'm very familiar with it. So mm. like, in a, you know, in a particular brand, I can, you know, pick up a camera and be just fine. Um, but I'm also hiring, you know, DPs and I'm hiring people to, to do certain things. And I look less for, and because I'm outside of those other worlds. I look uh, less for like what brand do you have. What I look for is what is the 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 person I'm hiring their competency with those pieces and how are they if they're fluent with those pieces and they can they also can bring a collaborative energy with it because they know those tools. You know, and so like and and I don't like lighting and stuff like that. Like I don't I, like there's some brands that I like but I don't care at the end of the day. I care what it looks like. As long as it gets the job done. I, I care what it looks like when in, in the job's done. Now, right. now there is a place to say that like, you know, like also I think some of that testing of what brands do you have from these other, in these other uh, markets is really about, you know, like you, if you're employed enough at what you do, you're buying the $5,000 right. mixer. So like some of that is just a test, like are you employed enough? Right, and, and, that's, and that's what I try to tell folks coming up that's how you're going to get that's how you get the job but it's also those are the tools that are required sometimes that $5000 field mixer is the thing you need and instead of in trying to use the $1200 mixer you're it's not going to have the features you need i mean there's an expectation sometimes with gear mm -hmm. that if you're going to do you're going to work you're going to go to that next level there's going to be certain things that the director is going to want and that the camera operators the dp is going to want they're going to want you to send pops to the camera you're going to need audio hops from, you know, and there's that some of the prosumer gear is it doesn't allow you to do that. You, you got to have that $5,000 mixer to be able to, to deliver on set. So it is kind of a, it, it's, it's also a measuring stick as to where you are in your career. You know, when you can buy, I remember when I bought my first sound devices piece, I'm like, man, I've arrived. I bought, I bought, I bought sound devices. I've got, I'm with the big boys now. I can roll with them. And if I get the call, I can go, yeah, I own that, and yeah, I can do that. Mm. But I also, the, the flip side of that equation is I think I'm good enough at what I do that I could do it with lesser gear, because then at that point, it's about your skill level. As you were saying, it's about your technique. You know, because you can sometimes get hired for something and they don't want to, they want to pay for you, but they don't want to pay for your gear. And they go, we want you to use our stuff. Well, if I really want to take that, either I'd, well, I'll walk away from that job, or I'll say, yeah, I'll take that job and I'll use your gear because I can work with that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of both. You need sometimes you need to have that gear. Sometimes it's just about your skill. Well, and I, I think it's different uh, markets. You know, like so it, when you're a nameless person, you know, being called up because you're you're you fit a crew position, um, then you, you you know you're in a different situation where you got to like give them the list of you know the tools that you have and. Um, but I think if you're talking about in a more local setting, like if you're doing work here locally, um, you know, it also, I think it also gets to a point of like, are you good at what you're doing? Mm -hmm. um, like, because, you know, there are also a lot of young folks who have access to a lot of resources that will come out and have like the most expensive camera. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you, and, you, and you're like, I I'm supposed to hire you because you have that camera? Like, I need to see what you've actually shot. Like, I need to see your reel. Yeah, I need to see, and not just like, do I need to see your reel? I like, how do you and I work right. together on a, on a thing? Like, how much are you open to hearing me and what I need? As You know what I mean? Like, as if I'm producing this, this project. And so like, so it's a catch 22. Some people have access to the resources and they just have the gear. Um, but the, you know, and, and I, and, and they show up and they, and they're shooting and you're like, and you're confused because you're like, you're, you don't know how to do, right. Like. Yep. Okay. And then it just, then it builds up sort of a resentment. Like, you know, like the, how, also have some, maybe I'm being too candid, like also have some respect for the craft. Right. Right. You know, right. like don't just gear up. Gear up and but, then, yeah, for it, gear up's sake. I yeah. think it's a combination of 
it's, it's not really the gear, it's, it's you, it's your skill, and it's your personality. I get hired more in personality than anything because I mesh well with a crew, you know? I'm, I work collaboratively, I'm, and I'm always, my big thing with doing field sound or any type of production is I know who, my, I know who I'm serving. I'm serving, for me as a sound person, I'm serving the overall production and the story. Those are the, those are, that's a 10,000 foot view. I'm really, my main client is the editor more than the producer. I mean, the producer's on set and they're, you're, they're, they're kind of your boss, but the moves I make in the field serve the editor because what I want is the editor to be able to seamlessly be able to work with the product that I deliver. And in some cases, now that I'm on both sides of the equation, I do field work and post, in some cases, I'm serving myself. The stuff I'm capturing in the field is like, well, I'm gonna be mixing this down the road, so I better make sure I do this and I think about that, but I'm always serving the editors. And then to serve the editors means you're serving the story. Yeah, like no, knowing workflow and knowing how you fit in there, where, where it is, absolutely. Right, right, right. So um, you, you guys brought this up a little bit during the discussion, and I'm, I'm curious to know, um, what would you say is some of the advantages that a lot of people in, in your fields have now as opposed to perhaps yesteryear? It's all gear, man. <laughs> Everything's so much easier. I mean, you could do, where's my phone? You could shoot something with this. I, when I started, as I mentioned earlier, I had the big old clunky camcorder. It wasn't even a camcorder at that point. It was a camera hooked up to a deck, and somebody else had to carry the deck and load tapes. Uh, and then we moved from there to camcorders with the tape inside. I worked on, started on VHS. And I edited on a, on a, you know, the link, like you were saying, the, the system where you put, you loaded your VHSs into the, the two decks and you had the controller in the middle. You can, I'm amazed that when I go out and I'm with my family and I'll shoot a little video of my kids doing something, I'll have it edited in 10 minutes on here and up on Facebook or up on YouTube. Mm. You can do anything with this. You know, it doesn't mean it's always good, right. <laughs> but you can do it. So that's what's changed. The fact that you can make a film today, right now, with this. I mean, Kanye West shot like three or four videos. Just He's like, I'm going to do it with my iPhone. And he did it. So that's, that's to me, that's what's different. I, th I think that that is definitely what's changing and changed. I think it's a double-edged sword um, because... Also now, like the market is shrinking, people's budgets are shrinking, and, and they're asking a, like a single person or a smaller group of people to accomplish what used to take, you know, several, <laughs> if not lots of people, depending on the size of the production. You know, back in the day, like you had somebody that was hitting the record on the audio, you had somebody that was on the camera. You know, you know, like you, you, you like here, you know, you look around, you're just like, how many people are in this room making this production happen? And you know, so like, so the art of what actually gets ha like happens in each of those roles uh, is uh, lessened, you know? And, and you know, like when I, I, I see this a lot because I'm in a position of hiring people that it's like, when I hire somebody who's from that, like comes from a different school of thought, you know, like where they really, they learned a position and they didn't call themselves something until they were in that, you know, I'm not trying to be all old school, like about, <laughs> but like, when they come, it's like you can see it in what they're doing. Um, but the sad part is, is that they're working um, now for pay that doesn't necessarily reflect yep. that expertise. Um, and you'll, you know, like you could find yourself in a job in a in a corporation or some place where that you're like the one woman crew or person that's doing everything. Um, and what's lost is like the 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 space to have like who's focusing on the story. You know, if, if, and when I, I mean, like, I can do those things. Like, I, I, like, but I know that the production quality, the client might not notice it, but I know what's possible if I am not running camera and asking the questions. Right. <laughs> right. Yep. I, mean? yep. I did that for many years. It's, it's when I freelanced, I was doing commercials on my own because I had to do that to pay the bills. And I was a one, one person band commercial, but it's hard to do everything right when you were, like you said, you're making sure you roll the camera but then I got to focus on sound, and then I have to worry about lighting. It's just, it's, you, 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 like you said, the client may not, and the client may go, wow, that's wonderful, but you go, man, ah, and then you know your peers are gonna go, ooh, you know, if you had, 
uh, a sound person, if you had had a DP or if you had somebody to light that or if you had somebody to do this, that, if you even had a PA to help carry the gear, that might have been, that might have saved you. That might have made that, that would have taken, it would have elevated your project from just being good enough to exceptional. Well, I remember like the first time I hired an assistant director, an AD. And a project, so I was like my first time I got a budget that was big enough to like hire the, an AD position. And I had a friend that's like I think is the best AD, right? Not just because she's my friend, <laughs> but um, you know. And I had her on set, and it was like the first time as a director I got to focus on story. Mm. Like I, you know, like I had like I, like the the upside is that I was really familiar with paying attention to schedule and and moving and doing all this stuff. So like the upside is like I wasn't a pain for the AD, you know what I mean? Although she might argue. Um, but it's like all of a sudden your brain space opens up and, and you're, you're, you get better performances from actors, you get you know, better performances from your whole crew because you, you've got the brain space. You know, and just realizing that all these positions play a role. Yeah, I was in the field yesterday and I'm lucky because I do work for a station that still, we still have a crew. We still have a DP. Our crews have shrunken, they've gotten smaller, but when I'm doing sound, that's all I'm worried about. I'm not worried about what the DP's doing. We work together and in concert, I'm asking is my boom in the shot, that kind of stuff, but I'm just there to focus on, okay, where am I putting these microphones? Where can I stand? Where can my boom go? Okay, is that scratchy? Or, you know, so it's, again, it's just, a, it's about being able to do your job. That's all I have to think about. I don't have to think about anything else. So that means I'm setting myself up to do a better job because I'm not worried about doing 10 other things. I'm just worried about perfecting the craft, my craft for that day. I'm jealous uh, I, when I've been on those crews with audio person and I'm the DP and I'm trying to set up the camera gear, audio person's over there twiddling their thumbs because they've been set up. Like they're all ready to go, they're good to go, and then like I got like I got to get the lights up, I got to get the camera up, I got to get you know you know so and some I mean like I'm not I, audio is awesome like it, thank you it not too many totally people say awesome. that <laughs> it is totally awesome and I'm envious at times like at the like the the size of the equipment <laughs> like well, you know like just the placement and like okay that's where I'm gonna put the light where the audio person is okay that's cool <laughs> yeah I, always, I have that fight all the time with with DPS I'm like okay we're I always ask the question where are you gonna go and then we do that we call it the dance and wherever the DP is gonna put their lights I'm like okay I'm gonna go on the opposite side of that but yeah it's just it's 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 nice being able to to have to be able to focus on to be a journey person in the thing that you're doing and work with other journey people and you can go, you can then work that relationship out and then it just it translates to better product on set. Nice. So um so we're gonna uh, have one more question, then we're gonna open up to uh, some questions to the uh, audience. Uh, my last question is, is there um, any advice that you would give to uh, someone who is looking to uh, be involved in the type of career that you guys are currently in? Oof, me, I, it, it, there's so much. <laughs> um, always be, there are a lot of people that come into the business and they're like, I know it all. No, you don't. I've been doing this for a long time and I learned something two days ago something that I didn't know, but that was critical. I'm mixing a show for Dan Bergen, who was on the first panel. I'm mixing a doc for him right now, or we just finished it. And I ran into a roadblock, and you don't, the you, ego, take it out. I had to go hat in hand. I've been doing this for a while, but I still had to go, you know what, Dan, I don't know how to do that. Let me find, let me figure that out. So always be willing to learn. You never know it all. The gear and everything is changing. The software is changing. You are always learning. Never stop learning. You've never, the minute I feel I've reached a point where I've learned it all, then I don't need to be doing it anymore because the fun for me is learning it. So, and then always, for me, I was told years ago, it's relationships. It's, you can have the best gear in the world, you can have all this stuff, but if you're a dickhead, sorry, no one wants to work with you. You know, it's relationships and it's the, the people that you've met. It's like, I know tomorrow if I were to lose my job at TPT, I could make three phone calls and be working again a few days from now. It's relationships, it's the people you meet, it's keeping those relationships and, and doing it, it's, yeah, it's relationships. It's all about relationships. So that's what I tell uh, students when I teach at IPR. It's the people that you meet along the way in your journey in this. 
those are the people you're still gonna see and the people that you will collaborate with and those are the folks that you can call when you've hit a stumbling block. And if you've had a measure of success, those are the people that you, you the friends, you can help them out. And I'm always about teaching what I know. When I started out in the business, I mean, it, the business is competitive. It's super competitive. I'm never, I'm not the one that's like, I know how to do something and I'm not gonna share that knowledge with you. I will gladly tell every person in this room everything that I know because I will get that back some way. I'll get it back, but then you also know have had the benefit of learning what I've learned, and then you, in that discussion, may show me something that I didn't know. So it's not about ego, that's gotta go, relationships, and never hoard your information. Share everything, because I promise you, you'll get it back. You may suddenly share everything, tell everything you know to someone, and then you may get a booking the next day. Just that's how life works. I mean, I would, I would echo that. The relationships is, is critical. Um, that's number one, like beyond anything else. Um, and then I think there's also the, the decision of like, are you going to get into this field uh, as an entrepreneur? Um, or are you gonna get into this field and fit into some sort of existing system? Mm -hmm. um, and because it, those are two very different paths. Uh, and and both equally valid, and, and you can be equally successful in either one of those paths, um, but they're, they're just very different about how you would go about doing it. I function better with a company. I did freelance, but it's too hard because I'm not a business person. I don't have a business mind. So I used to have my girlfriend, now wife, would do my books. Otherwise, I would do all this work and not get paid for it. So it, if, you wanna, if you think you're business savvy, you can do the freelance route as a way to go. I fit better, and I've always excelled in a corporate setting. Well, I wanna say thank you uh, to both Joanna and Terry for uh, coming out and talking a little bit about your craft and career. And um, please give these people a round of applause.